So I'm very happy to present um, Professor Gary Tubb, University of Chicago. Please, Gary. Any better? Yes. Okay. So on to Yamaka. Um, for me, it's exciting and uh, challenging too to be addressing both the participants in the longer seminar, who, as I understand it, have already looked briefly at the Yamaka section in uh, the mirror, and also those who are here only for the present conference. So I'll try to inform the latter in some way without boring the former uh, in so much as I can do that while being merely one of the latter myself. And I'll start with the basic terminology on uh, Yamaka. First of all, its definition. The name Yamaka, as I think you all know, refers to a device that is generally considered one of the ornaments of sound, Shabdalankara. And it occurs when a continuous series of syllables, including both the consonants and the vowels, is repeated in the same order but with different meaning. This specification that the, mean the two utterances must have separate meanings, different meanings, is clear in both theory and practice, except in a few of the earliest descriptions and examples. Although Dundon himself, as far as I can see, curiously uh, does not mention this, uh, although he is apparently content <coughs> to imply it by describing the repetition of meaning uh, near the end of his treatise as a fault. The most important formal division is one on which Dundin is expressly clear, uh, the division into subtypes depending upon the distinction that the second utterance can come either immediately after the first, this is what Dundin calls avyapeta, uh, unseparated, or after the separation uh, uh, produced by the intervention of other syllables, and this is what he calls vyapeta, separated. Now, what to call yamaka in English has also been a question. <coughs> um, quite a few people, including uh, Larry, who's here, and Mari Hattori, who's not here, uh, have uh, often used the word rhyme. And, in fact, the status and the function of rhyme in uh, the poetries of other languages involves many useful parallels with that of Yamaka. Egal Bronner has usually preferred the more literal translation of twinning, which helps to avoid... Hmm? <laughs> Happy to be of use. Um, and this helps to avoid some of the misleading aspects of the parallels uh, that I just mentioned. Uh, Renata Zernin, the author of the most detailed article on the history of Yamaka in early poetic theory, acknowledged the literal meaning of twin or geminate, uh, but preferred to leave the general term Yamaka untranslated, uh, while referring to the form in which the repetition occurs immediately, Dundin's avyapeta, as geminate, or sometimes as amredita, using a grammatical term, and the form in which the repetition occurs with other syllables intervening, Dundin's vyapeta, as internal rhyme. And uh, we may get back to this. Uh, and I prefer, of course, Egal's choice of uh, twinning. <laughs> Although, uh, since, since we are in Israel, I should note that I suspect that many here might assume that the term yamaka, like so many important words in modern Hebrew, is in origin an acronym. And uh, out of consideration for this expectation, I'm willing at least for purposes of presentation uh, to pretend that the three syllables of Yamaka uh, stand for three temporal aspects of past, present, and future, which are important both in the actual operation of Yamaka and uh, as providing the three main headings for my remarks today. So the past. The past is necessary in any instance of 
yamaka because the repeated utterance that accomplishes the device looks back by definition to an earlier utterance which it eventually duplicates. And I therefore take the first syllable, ya, to stand for yata purvam, uh, as before. And in the opposite direction, the initial utterance always looks forward to the later one, which will finally complete the yamaka. Uh, so it looks for this awaiting its fulfillment. And so I take the final syllable, ka, to stand for the question, kada, uh, when, or uh, in the forms of yamaka in which an existing pattern or other evidence predicts the placement of the second utterance, then we may take this ka as standing for the question, katam, how does it do it? And this, the question of how it's done, raises the central question concerning the present moment of each yamaka, that of its poetic impact and its actual working. Is it something pleasing or not? And on this vexed question, I take the middle syllable, ma, to stand for madura, delightful, a word which, as Igal has already pointed out in his very useful summary of the discussions on yamaka that took place in his highly envied International Synod of Scholars here in Jerusalem, as Igal has pointed out, um, uh, the word uh, madura, delightful or charming, is prominently used by Dundon, both in his theoretical discussion of yamaka and in the, other, in, in the examples he gives of it, uh, as we'll see in part. However, with an eye to the controversies involving the aesthetic impact of yamaka, it might also be useful to think of the syllable ma as standing for another Sanskrit word for charming, namely manohara. Because this word manohara, in its literal meaning, makes clearer the coexistence of two senses inherent in the notion of mental or emotional captivation or attraction. Not simply charming, but also distracting. Since the point at issue <coughs> has very often been whether the possible aesthetic contribution of yamaka is derailed by the mental effort required, both of the poet and of the reader, which is something that uh, uh, Larry has written about in his <coughs> work on teleology and that Nigal has written about at length in his book on Schlesia, uh, because many of the same controversies apply to that figure as well. So these same three tenses will inform the larger structure of my remarks today, uh, taken relative to Dundin's own time, that is, the past. How does the treatment of Yamaka by earlier authors figure in Dundin's treatise? Uh, his present, what does Dundin's presentation, including his examples, say about the poetic purposes of Yamaka? And as for the future, how are Dundin's remarks connected with the subsequent history of his text? To begin with the past, the first point mentioned by Egal in his discussion summary uh, is that throughout the history of Sanskrit poetics, the device of yamaka has been viewed with considerable ambivalence. And Egal mentions also that this ambivalence is reflected in a striking way in the treatises of Bamaha and Dundon. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to rehearse the whole history of who made disparaging remarks about Yamaka and who did not, but it's important to note that where Bamaha had dealt with Yamaka and the related category of riddles or prahelika uh, very tersely and dismissively, Dundon gave to both a much fuller and positive treatment. <coughs> but <coughs> Egal has also pointed out that even Dundon did not consider all instances of these devices to be aesthetically pleasing. When he first arrives at Yamaka in connection with the topic of alliteration, Dundon remarks that Yamaka is not invariably charming and that he will therefore deal with it later. And in fact, Dundon ends up placing both Yamaka and Prahelika in what Igal refers to as a kind of appendix uh, at the end. 
in the final chapter of the work, leading up to the section on poetic flaws. Now, there are several reasons for this ambiguity with which Yamaka was viewed both before and after Dunden. Uh, uh, the most obvious of, of these is simply the very wide range of types and especially of intensity that are available for Yamaka, a range that is presented quite vividly by Dunden himself, both in theory and in <coughs> practice. Uh, a spectrum of difficulty uh, where Dunden explicitly distinguishes between easy and difficult forms of yamaka, a matter of great importance in the anxieties about distraction or derailment that I've mentioned, and in his long series of examples, he progresses gradually from simpler and charmingly accessible verses to much more complex and difficult forms. And so it's not surprising at all that with reference to such a wide spectrum, individual critics would disagree on where to draw the line between the <coughs> charming and the flashy, if they're willing to admit a line at all. F um, in general terms, the issue here is one that's basic in dealing with poetry in any language. The relationship, if any, between formal patterns, uh, including not only the repetition of sounds, but also the repetition and the structuring of rhythms, and in Dundon, meter is inextricable from uh, instances of Yamaka. The relationship between formal patterns and semantic structures. Uh, is, that is the question of whether Yamaka, the verbal device Yamaka, uh, produces any additional elements of meaning that we ought to pay attention to. For Sanskrit uh, writers specifically, both on grammar and on poetics, um, there's much talk early on of a spectrum of types of repetition where the same or similar meanings are involved in different ways, including, to begin with, amredita, or the doubling of a word in a single repeated meaning, latanuprasa, uh, or the repetition of a word with similar but pregnant meaning in the second instance, and ponorupta, or ponoruptavat, involving actually reprehensible or merely apparent repetitions of meaning. And Yamaka takes this series to new levels. Uh, another cause uh, for ambiguity <coughs> or for distrust of this device is, again, one that Larry's written quite a bit about, uh, which is uh, uh, the degree to which an individual critic focuses on the importance or the centrality of aesthetic theory based on the uh, suggestion of rasa. Uh, and it's here that the concerns for the pernicious effect of special effort on the part of both author and reader looms quite large. But disagreements influenced by these concerns were already apparent well before the time of the Dwanya Loka, the treatise most often considered paramount in advancing this theory. And the earlier forms of this divide can be seen in the tendency of early writers who are apparently oriented towards stage plays, including Udbata and Vamana, uh, their tendency to be averse to Yamaka, in contrast to those oriented more towards other poetic forms, including Dundon. So that the generic setting of instances of Yamaka seems to uh, influence uh, theory in general and evaluation of Yamaka in particular. Uh, the opposition to Yamaka on the part of critics that who emphasize the importance of suggestion, including above all Anand de Vordana, involves a couple of ironies to which I will return. One is Anand de Vardana's own notorious enthusiasm for Yamakas uh, and other difficult devices in his own virtuoso poem, the Devi Shataka. And another is uh, the fact that such critics have sometimes been blinded to the existence of arguably powerful forms of suggestion through Yamaka uh, because of the rigidity of their focus on the supreme importance of rasa as a particular object of suggestion. Uh, another form of ambiguity lies in the theoretical difficulties that are inherent in the categorization of Yamaka. Uh, to begin with, question of whether Yamaka should be viewed as an alankara or a guna, 
although yarmulke is usually taken up under the heading of ornaments of sound, shabdalankars, along with items such as anuprasa or alliteration, it shares with those items some uncertainty on why it should not be considered a guna or quality instead, along with um, quite a number of other aspects <coughs> of phonetic texture. There's a similar problem in the question of whether it is merely uh, an instance of Shabdachitra or Shabdalankar, or whether more uh, official notice should be given to the role of meaning in the identification of Yamaka. Uh, and uh, it's this role of meaning that I want to focus on in uh, uh, the remarks that follow. Uh, and this involves the requirement of a difference in meaning uh, in the very definition of yamaka. On a superficial level, this problem of the role of meaning arises because the second utterance is required to have a different meaning from the first. On a deeper level, the problem arises whether it may be suspected or shown that yamakas involve the suggestion of further meanings or, more specifically, of further meanings in the form of ornaments of sense. On both these levels, the superficial and the deeper, these problems are among the many features that Yamaka and Shlesha, bitextual poetry, share in common. Since Yamaka uh, can, uh, after a manner of speaking, be viewed simply as Shlesha, in which the sounds with two meanings are explicitly uttered twice rather than once. And as on nearly every topic involving bitextual poetry, the Bible on this topic is Eagle's book, uh, Extreme. Po I always have to be careful to say poetry and not use the title given in the list of titles in this series in which it appeared, which is Extreme Poverty. Uh, <laughs> just the, the opposite of what, what the book contained. Uh, for our focus on uh, today on, on Yamaka, it's, it's worth pausing to consider some of the effects of the difference between these two devices, um, which is something that I wrote about in an earlier visit to Jerusalem in a chapter on Maga that appeared in a book that some of us did. Uh, in Yamaka, the sounds that contain more than one meaning are made explicitly obvious so that the presence of a second meaning is inescapable. And the reader is forced to consider what that mi meaning might be, rather than pretending to notice it in the case of a difficult shlesha, or failing to notice it. As a result, although Yamaka may appear to focus primarily on similarities of sound, with considerations of meaning secondary, the need to consider these meanings can be thought of as putting the focus on those meanings rather than on the similarity in sound. And this serves to call attention to the presence of more than one meaning. Whether this is good or bad, in aesthetic terms, will depend upon whether one sees it as delaying or impeding the savoring of something else, or sees it as working to accomplish a worthwhile production of further meaning. This is one of the points on which the theory on Schlesia may be useful to a fuller understanding of Yamaka. And again, it's something on which Larry has written in explaining that Schlesia theory may require a relationship between the two meanings simultaneously expressed in leading to an understanding of a further alankara. And in fact, Egal has given many examples of this function at work uh, in Schlesia. So the question of whether or under what conditions Yamaka may do a similar thing uh, is one of interest to me, but one that has not been often explored. Uh, it involves some general issues of form versus meaning, and it's relevant here that in his treatment of Yomaka, Dundon deals only with verse, and with the small technical exception of shloka abhyasa, uh, uh, or the repetition of an entire verse, uh, uh, he has uh, a very narrow focus on, uh, on verse forms, which reflects some widespread presuppositions, I suspect, on the essential nature of poetry. Uh, for Sanskrit poetry, these uh, come to appear naive 
when set against a growing sophistication in the analysis of poetry that's composed in prose, or in prose mixed uh, with verse, possibilities that Dundon himself describes, despite his uh, emphasis on verse forms. But in many other languages, the use of rhyming is as important as that of verse in popular notions of what constitutes poetry. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. In, in English, a simple example is the popular practice of saying, when one has accidentally produced a rhyme, I was a poet and didn't know it. Uh, as if rhyme were enough to be poetry. And anyone who has taught Sanskrit to English speakers knows how automatically they also equate verse uh, with poetry. In English, it's at the level of simple end rhyme that we find disputes parallel to those involving yamaka in Sanskrit. Perhaps the most famous example uh, is in the explanation added by John Milton in the second edition of Paradise Lost, uh, in which he, uh, he gives uh, an, expl uh, an explanation of why the poem rhymes not, apparently in response to a uh, uh, reader request, uh, and in which he puts forward precisely the same two arguments made by Anandavardhana against Yamaka, namely those of propriety, or achitya, and of the separate effort that I've referred to. Milton speaks <coughs> of what is apt and fit, apt and fit, and also derides what he calls the vexation, hindrance, and constraint that rhyme involves. In Sanskrit, end rhyme is normally avoided anyway by good poets. Presumably, this is connected with how easy it is to rhyme the ends of words in a highly inflected language like Sanskrit or Latin. And of course, the Roman poets also tended to avoid uh, accidental end rhymes. But in Sanskrit, it's not simply that it's easy to make such rhymes. It's more that it's also easy to do even more um, in Sanskrit than it is in many other languages, as Egal has documented at length. So one could say that although similar disputes arise in Sanskrit and Latin and English, in Sanskrit the cutoff point is much higher in the spectrum between poetic and pedantic effects. And one other general issue that I'll mention is that of the unity of a larger work, uh, which again is something uh, which is difficult to address in dealing with Dundon, given his focus on isolated individual verses. Uh, his choice of meters has also led him to avoid dealing with the role of, for example, non-rhyming syllables preceding the Yamaka segments, despite their apparent importance in extended passages of Yamaka in poets such as Kalidasa. Uh, for example, in the Drota Vilambita meter, uh, in the, in the Raghavamsha, where the fourth quarter of each verse begins with a non-rhyming syllable, followed by two anapests, which contain the Yamaka segments. Uh, while Dundin's opening examples, as we'll see in a second of Yamaka, are also mostly composed uh, using this same pattern of double anapests, in his shorter Anerstub meter, there is no room for a syllable preceding these segments, and therefore the variation in that syllable is not available to him uh, as a device for producing meaning. Uh, there are many parallels for this in other South Asian uh, uh, poetries, including, for example, the Ghazal in, in Persian and Urdu, where each couplet ends with a string of identical sounds, preceded by a rhyming word, which varies from couplet to couplet, which is itself preceded by uh, a sequence of phonemes that are not involved in, in rhyme. <coughs> um, for the guzzle, the question of what kind of unity these couplets may have has been a hotly disputed topic, and the possible suggestions of contrast and similarities and other elements as a result of their operation has uh, been a big part of these discussions. Um, similar work needs to be done on corresponding questions in passages such as Kalidasa's, where the narrative connection of the verses is already obvious, but where the further connections in terms of running suggestions, comparisons, contrasts, have not been thoroughly studied. And 
One of the problems in Dundon's treatment is that he does not provide us an easy way to determine how he might have felt about these possibilities. And so this brings me to the topic of uh, Dundon's present and the examination of his treatment of Yamaka. And here, it's these questions of additional meaning that I find especially intriguing. Uh, since other topics such as the formal classification of types of Yamaka appear to me to operate largely on a more obvious and superficial level. Um, right. uh, let me first say just briefly that, uh, as I mentioned, I've taken up the topic of production of meaning in yamakas in this book, uh, Innovations and Turning Points, in two of the chapters there, one of which deals with the Mahakavyas of Maga and before him Bharavi and Bhati and Kalidasa, and the other deals with the more recent poet Kavikarnapura, who used uh, uh, Yamaka both in Champu and in stage plays, two genres that involve mixed verse and prose. And there I tried to catalog a few of the ways in which extended passages involving yamaka seem to involve the production of further uh, meanings through the juxtaposition of two meanings in the yamaka segments. I think I identified five different types of meaning, which we don't have time to go into in detail, one of them being analytical, involving contrast and uh, uh, similarities in other relationships, something that Eagle has written about in connection with Schlesia. Another being in extended passages, the kind of musical effect of, which I've called hypnotic, that you see, for example, in the Gita Govinda. And here, Keith, who liked the Gita Govinda more than any other poem other than the Megadutta, speculated on the role of Upabramsha and Prakrit rhymes in the development of these yamakas, another topic that could probably use some further study. The third type of meaning that I thought I found was a sort of subliminal meaning operating below the surface uh, to deliver comments and warnings that are actually at odds with the superficial narrative meaning of the passage. Uh, a, a fourth type of meaning uh, was the dazzling effect of yamaka that's used in the more extreme chitra forms, for example, in the descriptions of mountain ranges by Bharavi and Maga, where the intent uh, seems to be to impress the reader with sound effects that are more important than the literal meaning, but which do correspond in uh, some ways to the topic being described. And finally, there's a use of yamaka that I uh, refer to as emblematic, in which the, the very choice of using yamaka seems to mark an ongoing situation of multiple identities alongside the individual analytical features that I've already mentioned. And this is what one can see, for example, in the works of Kavi Karnapura, who uses a very distinctive extreme type of yamaka in uh, his champu uh, and in his plays, uh, extending even to the use of yamaka in stage directions. And in, in his practice, this seems to be emblematic of the lila or the play of Krishna in situations involving reenacted identities, uh, something that runs throughout the entire Vrindavana, Lila Champu, but which comes to a sudden end early on in the play about the life of Krishna Chaitanya, <laughs> precisely at the point where Chaitanya becomes a renunciate ascetic, and this Lila of multiple identities stops. Uh, this is something written about uh, more effectively by Egal in his uh, treatment of the Kichikavada, uh, a work where again there are multiple identities, and where Egal has seen what he calls a division of labor between Shlesha and Yamaka in dealing with covert and overt uh, instances of multiple identities. So I'd like to turn at a long last to a very brief look at uh, just the very beginning of uh, Dundon's examples. 
Uh, I think you have a ha handout for this. Um, I'll just mention first very quickly, again, a couple of problems uh, in his treatment of Yamaka. An initial technical problem is that he doesn't expressly mention that the second occurrence, here the Yamakas are marked by underlining and bold print, has to involve different meanings, but they always do in all of his examples. A more serious problem is that the limitations in his formal presentation of the types of yamaka, uh, despite its length, uh, is restricted in several ways. First, even in covering in a sort of mathematical way the various permutations involved, he doesn't give all of the possibilities, but just enough to let you see how you could work out the scheme for yourself. So he starts with a single repetition, which you will see is in the pattern I've mentioned before, uh, that we find also in Bhatti and, and uh, Kalidasa of two anapas, Chetaram Chetaram, Rahitai Rahitai Rahitai. Uh, and he has it uh, in the two preceding verses, first in the first quarter, then in the second quarter, here in the third quarter, then in the fourth quarter. In the next verse he will go to one in which there are two repetitions, and so forth. So he gives some of these, but not all of them. Um, and this is significant because his failure to give all of them precludes the examination of possible differences in meaning depending upon placement. And second, as I've said, his examples are limited to isolated verses, and he gives no examples of continuous passages. Uh, third, he offers no examples of different types involving placement within a verse quarter, rather than at the beginning, padadi, or at the end, padanta. Everything else is padamadya, but with, with no uh, discussion of whether it makes a difference if it comes at the beginning of the middle or the end of the middle. And uh, as I mentioned in, in Kalidasa, for example, it does make a difference. And finally, the metrical limitations uh, of his examples make it impossible to see how he would handle what became the standard meters for many types of running yamaka, uh, such as Drutavilambita and Ritodutha. But even so, his examples do offer some scope for examining issues of meaning. Uh, first of all, it's worth noting that um, in these early simple examples, the examples are actually quite easy to follow. There's a remarkable clarity. Uh, Dundon progresses very noticeably from simpler to more complex <coughs> examples. One of the markers of this progression is uh, uh, how clearly the commentators uh, increase in the degree to which uh, they are uncertain about the meaning and the degree to which they disagree with each other. Uh, so here I offer just a very small sampling from the beginning of this progression. And in addition to seeing how he lays out the formal arrangement and to how he deals in the beginning with the double anapast pattern, uh, I'd also like you to notice the simple fact of Dundin's skill in producing such clear and powerful examples. And so we can see here a couple of reasons why Dundin uh, may have given so much attention to Yamakas despite the theoretical ambiguities. He was very good at composing them, and he seems to have really enjoyed composing them. These are the same two reasons that Ingalls gave for why Anandavardhana wrote this virtuoso poem full of yamakas and chitra, uh, the Devi Shataka. There, there was an additional reason. Anandavardhana had the excuse of having been ordered to write the poem by the goddess who appeared to him in a dream. But Dundon can also give the excuse of uh, a compulsion, uh, his expository obligation to exemplify a device that he knew to be powerful. So, in these first two examples, do we have any time left? How are we doing yes, on this time? Fine. Okay. Um, okay, that'll be that'll be fine. Rajan vatya prajajata bhavantam prapya sampriti chataram chataram bodhi rashanorvi karagrahe. And I have put a lot of work into making the translations as pedestrian as possible in order to place Dundin's skill in greater relief. Uh, your subjects have now become well-ruled. This is a special meaning of the word Rajan, Rajanwant, 
as opposed to Rajavad. Uh, so your subjects, Praja, have become well ruled by obtaining you, Bhavantam Prapya, now. You who are skillful, Chataram, a word with many meanings, in Chataram Bodhi Rashanurvi Karagrahe, in the Karagraha, in collecting taxes from the entire world, or in marrying, because the king marries the earth, the entire earth. Um, and there are several shleshas here. One of them is the double meaning of karagreha, uh, marrying and collecting taxes. There's another one, if we take a variant reading for some priti of satpati, which would mean a good husband. Uh, although that somewhat conflicts with the other double meaning, which is that of praja as meaning both <coughs> subjects and offspring. So there the king becomes a good parent uh, because of his skill. And the main thing I want to point out here, aside from the degree to which the verse is fully packed with meaning through these bitextual devices and through other things, it's also worth pointing out that this is, I believe, an example of what Egal has written about and I've written about, which is the use of double meanings um, to bring out uh, comment on the relationship between the things referred to in the two meanings, some kind of connection or distinction, sometimes a causal one. And here, it's important to realize that the word chatur and chaturambodhi is basically uh, a concise way of referring to the entire wor world, the earth as bounded by all four oceans. And this is connected with the fact that the king is chatara. It's because of his skill uh, uh, that he is able to gain control over the entire earth. Similarly, in the next verse, which is a verse about the uh, defeat of enemies, Aranyam kaistira krantam anyai sadma devaukasam padati retanagashwa rahitai rahitai stava. So, here of course my translation gets it backwards. It begins by saying, some of them have crowded into the forest, some of them has filled up the halls of heaven. And we find out only later at the end who they are. They are people who are devoid of all four divisions of Indian armies, the infantry, uh, the cavalry, the chariots, uh, the elephants. They are devoid of these. They are his enemies. And here again, there's clearly a causal connection pointed to. Our attention is drawn to the connection between Rahita and Ahita. Why are they Rahita? Why have they lost everything they had? Because they were Ahita, his enemies. Worse than that, they were not even good for themselves, right? They were Ahita. Uh, and I think I'll, uh, if I can get this too, I can't. Well, you have the handout though, right? Uh, I'm not sure how to work the keypad here. Um, I think I'll refer just to one more verse um, because it uses the word that he all called our attention to. Yeah, that one's enough. Just that verse, verse 3, 8. Madaram, madaram boja, vadane vadane tro yoho, vibramam brahmara brantya vidamba yantikinnute. This is supposed to be a verse spoken by a young man to a woman after he has seen... Uh, a lotus in the springtime with bees buzzing above it, and he, he uses the standard comparisons between her face and the lotus and between her rolling eyes and the rolling bees. Lotus face lady, if that is vocative, Ambojubadine, tell me, is springtime, this is the subject, Madhu, is he trying to imitate the charming movements of your eyes? with the rolling of the bees. If we take vibranti to mean vibramana, the rolling of her eyes, probably more likely that vibranti is used cognitively under the mistaken belief that her eyes are bees. And he thinks, that's a great way to use bees, I'm going to do that too. <laughs> and he, he has the bees roll around on the lotus, which is like her face, in which case Ambojavadene could also be locative. Does he have his bees roll around on the face, which is actually a lotus. So, the thing to point out here 
is not so much in the uh, particular pairs of words. These happen to be words that have been in constant use for Yamaka long before Dundon. They were used by Bharavi. They were used by Bhatti. Probably borrowed by Bhatti from Bharavi. Um, but the thing I want to call your attention to is once again Dundon's remarkable skill and how much he has packed into this. I'll mention just one thing, which is that he has, if we take the reading of Vibranti as meaning a mistaken notion, he has packed into this verse four different standard ways of referring to comparison. So we have first the uh, compound containing comparison, lotus face. Uh, we have the co cognitive device of referring to a misidentification. We have the verb to imitate, which is something that Dundon lists as a way of, of expressing comparison. And we have Kim Nute, we have the speculative questioning marked by the particle nu. And all of these in one verse, together with two yamakas, but a verse that, aside from the question of choosing which of two meanings to use in a couple of places, is actually quite clear and also brings together uh, an impressive number of conventions um, in Sanskrit poetry. So, uh, in the interest of time, uh, just to turn very quickly to the future, uh, I'll have to refrain from discussing of any of the further examples of Yomaka given by Dundon, and I'll turn just very quickly to the topic of the later adaptations of Dundon's poetics. And on this, I have very little to offer in comparison with the remarks that will be made here by so many scholars working on so many aspects uh, of this legacy. As uh, uh, Egal has mentioned, but was too modest to describe fully, this is surely th the most extensive and powerful gathering ever assembled to, uh, to address this worthy subject of Dundin's mirror and what happened to it. And so, on the topic of the future of Dundon's work, I, uh, I await the offerings about to come in the immediate future of, of this panel <laughs> and, and of those that follow. Um, uh, we've had a preview of some of those offerings in Eagle's summary on Yamaka, from which I learned, among other things, that the language-specific nature of Yamaka has made the relevant sections in treatises uh, in other languages rather difficult to follow. And I've also learned in conversation with Egal of his interest in the possibility of seeing meta-references to the relationship between Dundon and the future works based on him uh, in his treatment of Yamaka with its parallel relationship between the initial utterances and the corresponding ones that follow. But on both the difficulties of reflecting in other languages uh, Dundon's views on Yamaka and the role of meta-references within his treatment, I do defer to the future speakers here because of my own lack, both of their regional and linguistic expertise, and also my lack of, at the moment, of the sort of refined mystical insight that, uh, as I know from happy experience, participation in an extended seminar with Egal and with David and with uh, Charlie and their uh, compadres is capable of generating in a very exciting way. So uh, I'll just conclude by thanking Egal for his constant wisdom and energy in making these gatherings possible, and I'll look forward to the fullness that's promised by the presentations yet to come. if you could say something about the possible role in the reluctance to recognize the significance of Artha in Yamaka and the difficulty of classifying it as either a Shabda or an Artha Alankara. And, and in connection with that, maybe comment if you feel it worthy on um, Udbata, Udbata, who notably eliminates Yamaka. He does not recognize it as a figure and replaces it very obviously with Punaruktavat Abasa, which is a purely meaning-based 
right. figure. The repetition of or strings of sounds that appear to have the same meaning, whether they're phonetically identical or not, <laughs> occupy this space. Um, and as a separate sort of side note, um, what makes you say that Udbata is um, oriented towards stage plays? <laughs> well, uh, I think I said that. Uh, you said Vamana and Udbata. Uh, Vamana and Udbata. With Udbata, I think I was thinking about his commentary. He never quotes plays ever. Never. Not once. Well, then I'll revise that uh, <laughs> okay. that opinion. Uh, so I'm not quite sure why he's so irritated by uh, uh, Yamaka, and uh, he he does replace it with um, Punaruktuva. Uh, Do you think the unclassifiability itself, the fact that Yamaka as treated? isn't quite Shabna and isn't quite Artha. I mean, to me, that seems, that's my sense of why he does what he does with it. I think that's part of it. Uh, there's another, there could be another reason uh, lurking underneath, which I didn't actually talk about, but which is connected with the wide range of uh, yamakas, including Dushkara, difficult ones, which is that, uh, actually, a commentator comments on this, I it might have been Nami Sadhu, I can't remember. Uh, Renata has a footnote on this in her article, but I didn't bring my note on this, but the, the point of the comment is that um, because the yamakas, many kinds of yamakas are dushkara, uh, in addition to meaning that they're difficult to do, it also means that as a consequence they are usually done badly. So uh, part of the problem, I suspect, is simply that so many examples of yamaka uh, don't have much to offer in the way of additional meaning and, and can be irritating in themselves. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I think we need to be honest about the fact that, I mean, you can't just parachute into the middle of Dundon's examples of Yamaka and immediately find easily explainable uh, generation of additional meaning. Uh, it about uh, yeah. the other languages that are using uh, Yamaka, they have an advantage. See, the word in uh, their own language and the word in the Sanskrit, they use together to bring about the Yamaka. In Kaviraja Marga, we have examples. Tara, Tara Adhinetrayam. Tara is in Kannada. Tara means bring. See, Tara Netrayam or Tarala Netrayam, like that. So, that, that is a Sanskrit word. Bara, Baranamam Noda. Barana is Varana. Varana in Sanskrit. Va becomes Ba, Baranamam. Bara means come. Come and see the elephant. Like that, the languages uh, like Kannada, Tamil, Telugu, etc., they offer a greater scope to make the Yamakas, and the uh, poets of those languages have taken advantage of it and have made many uh, yamakas. That's a good point, and I would add to that that there's, in, there's even further opportunity for yamakas in the fact that it's not just that some Sanskrit words correspond in sound to words in southern languages, but there's also the fact, which now Ryan Arau has written about, and David could uh, verify this, that there are Sanskrit words which have one meaning in general classical Sanskrit, but a different meaning in Telugu. And so that gives you a third, uh, uh, third dictionary to draw on. Yeah. So let's see, there was also uh, Andrew and then David. Um, to add a language, um, uh, so Prakrit has um, kind of advantages in doing Yamaka because so many different <coughs> Sanskrit words are homophonous in Prakrit, like Amshuka and Ashru can both become Amsua. And um, this is, uh, so Yamaka is a structural principle of some of the verses in the uh, Prakrit Mahakavyas that Dandan was reading, including the Setu Bhanta. And I was wondering whether um, the, the, the fate of Yamaka and its reception, its critical reception, um, how closely that depends on the corpus of literature that people were reading. So can we say that Dundon is possibly very interested in, in Yamaka because it's a feature of, the, of some of the literature that he was reading, especially the Prakrit literature. And when that falls out of the canon in, uh, in later 
uh, centuries, then yamaka seems to be a, a completely technical dushkara device. That makes good sense. And not only because people were no longer so interested in reading it, but also because they were no longer so capable of reading it, which I think is, is kind of a consequence of that change in... So I think David... Is So I wonder what you think about um, sixth type among the five, you know, in addition to the five categories that you've listed. Um, I'd like to get to 18. Uh, <laughs> so here's one, uh, unless it per possibly is subsumed under your uh, notion of musical or hypnotic effects, but I think Yamaka um, often serves as a kind of framing device or a transition marker. For example, a cl classical case of this is in the ninth... Um, chapter of the Raghuvansha, mm -hmm. which is the kind of locus classicus of uh, Yamaka and Kalidasa. And that's the chapter where the Ramayana, embedded Ramayana segment, basically begins, right? Mm -hmm. So it's almost as if the poet was announcing in a musical way, or a sort of non-semanticized way, that something is about to change. That's the section on Dilipa in the... Yeah. That's uh, Dasharatha goes out hunting. Dasharatha, when Dasharatha goes hunting, that's the section that I wrote about in uh, chapter seven in the the book that we did together. Uh, it's a chapter called uh, "Kavi with Bells On," or what's a flashy verse like you doing in a great poem like this? And there, I think I referred to one of the one of the uh, aspects of that passage as being a kind of interlude, which I think was I had something similar in mind, but there I also felt that there were um, underlying warnings because it moves from a fairly sedate scene into one of drinking and from <coughs> there into a kind of irresponsible <coughs> hunting. And there you get a third meaning which is not simply a kind of suggested meaning from the juxtaposition of two things, but actually involves a third resegmentation sometimes. <coughs> so that you get words which are not either of the of the two meanings being directly compared, mm -hmm. but it's a, th a third right. segment from the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And that's also where the metrical part of it yeah. is important because Kalidasa treats Yamaka segments differently metrically from the other quarters in these verse. Yeah, so I think that's a, it's a good way to put it, the musical use of it. Yeah. Uh, So, I was wondering if you could just say more about how you feel about, about the relationship between kind of theoretical pressures on one side about kavya doshas and is this a guna or a dosha, and the kind of, I mean, you mentioned Anandavardhana and the Devi Shataka, and the other one I was thinking of was Abhinavagupta, the one, comment, the one poem that he comments on is a Yamaka poem. Uh, so, it seems kind of interesting that Everyone seems to love and compose these poems, but yet we have a or there's a difficulty in putting them in a specific sort of place. I yeah. don't know. <laughs> no, I think there are clearly tensions there. And also uncertainties on our side, uh, I mean, a lack of knowledge. We don't know how these people actually compartmentalize their lives. Uh, Egal is a little about this in connection with Epayadikshita, about the different kinds of things that he wrote and how, and some of them wilder than others. So we don't know whether Abhinavagupta's interest in the Yamaka poem was sort of his uh, disco evening or something, <laughs> I don't know, uh, or his blowing off steam. Uh, it's hard not to believe that both Anandavardhana and Dundon really enjoyed uh, making the yamakas that they <coughs> actually made and should have been proud of them and uh, probably were. But the placement by Dundon of yamaka, first of all, he explicitly removes it from the place where you would think it would come up and says, I'm, I'm putting it somewhere, I'll get to it later. And where he puts it is basically, in the, he puts it in the, same, uh, in the same part with the doshas. And the thing that's in between is Prahalika, which is in even uh, shakier repute than, uh, than the Yamaka. So uh, I have to believe from uh, 
Eagle's characterization of Dundon, that he was perfectly free to do whatever he wanted to do and was open-minded about it um, as well. But given that, the place that he put it is, is definitely uh, provocative. Yeah. In terms of the future of Dundin's text, I think I think uh, <coughs> all that is true. But more than ten percent of the text is dedicated to this one topic of Yamaka. It's a huge, uh, hugely important topic for Dundin. And and in my mind, given what you've just said about the popularity, the 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 fact that people enjoyed Yamaka, the fact that people love doing that, the fact that people in some capacity or some had were, were really invested in Yamaka. I think that is part of the secret of success of, of, of Dandin's Kavya Dasha. The whole section, it's true that it's leading to that bit on doshas, but there's a whole section, big section, long section on the book that's dedicated to Chitrabandhas and Yamakas and even Prahelikas. In, in a, in a, it, takes, it takes his time to deal with these things and to show very methodo methodically how, how you can create all yeah, these Yeah, and you kind of wonder whether he had a notebook in which he gave every form and he decided he better cut it down. But one of the things that I, well, I'll identify just one of the things I said that wasn't actually true, which is uh, the explicit repetition of the string the second time doesn't actually force us to, to work it out. And, you know, part of the, there's no doubt that Yamaka is fun to listen to, even if you don't take that trouble. So if you listen to someone singing uh, Nalodia, for example, it's, uh, it's enjoyable just listening to it, even if you have no idea uh, what it means. Or you catch a Gita Govinda is the same way, where it actually goes beyond um, being fun, you know, to being, to being, uh, ritually effective. I mean, it produces a trance and it's used for that. And it's, it's beautiful to listen to even if you only, you know, connect on about a quarter of the meanings. So, can we do one more? Last question. Okay. Just one comment, if I may. I, I happen to, to have worked on this uh, some 10, 15 years ago. Uh, concerning the position of, of the discussion on, on the Yamakas, I came to the conclusion at that time that Dunning was utterly systematic. He mentions first the Yamakas in connection with Madhurya because it is mm. sweet. And then he says, he, he announces, I'll discuss this later, where in the section on the Shabdalankaras. Why? Because the Yamakas is, is a Shabdalankara. And this is clearly uh, separated from the discussion of the Doshas. So uh, I, I would, I, I've written this uh, about this I in my in my edition on the third chapter. So I don't want now to, to spend. But you're saying that he was systematic, or he, he was, was systematic. He was, systematic he was absolutely systematic. It. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's also explicit about the dividing of where he thinks the Dushkara ones are are starting. <coughs> well, I in fact, uh, Renate Zion uh, Timer was, I th I think, wrong. Uh, he doesn't explicitly say which Yamakas he considers Dushkara and which he, he considers uh, easy to, to, to construct. There is no clear differentiation. If, if you read properly the text on the Yamakas, there is no definition where he differentiates clearly wi which is the Sukara and which is the Dushkara. Yeah, he says these are the Dushkara forms, but he says that at the end, right? No, the Before? No, in the middle. In the middle. You have shown He says yeah, in, so in the beginning that he'll 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 t uh, he'll uh, uh, present some easy and some difficult ones. Yeah, but, but the point where he says the yeah, he does have a demarcation. Well, there. I might be wrong, uh, but uh, uh, if I may just refer to my my, my exposition on, on this matter, it's it's in in the introductory part of of the edition on the third chapter. There I have written on this. You're free, of course, to disagree with me, but that's okay. what I, I meant to say at that time. Well, I'll take a look at it. Yes. Get back to you on that. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, I first want to thank all three speakers from this morning. It was a wonderful beginning. 
Um, thank you, all three of you. Uh, we're going to reconvene here at 2.30. And for the participants in the workshop and their invited guests, there's going to be a light lunch next door in this room. We're here to the right, room 128. Okay, so we have uh, almost two hours of a break, and we'll meet again at 2.30.